Okay, so today uh, we will start a new system. Okay, that's the respiratory system. The main function of the respiratory system is the respiration. That's why it is called the respiratory system. First, we'll see the parts of the respiratory system. Then we'll talk about the processes of respiration. There are four processes of respiration. Only one we can see from outside. That's the inhalation and exhalation that we, we can uh, see from outside. Other three processes take place inside the body. We don't see those. So there are four processes of respiration. We'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about the nose, which is the first organ or part of the respiratory system. The uppermost structure is the nose. We'll see the structure of the nose and the functions of the nose. Okay. Then we'll talk about the pharynx. Pharynx is the part next to the nose. After nose, next organ is the pharynx. Pharynx is a muscular tube. It has three parts. We'll talk about those three parts of the pharynx. Then, below the pharynx, you have the next organ which is the larynx. Larynx is also a tube-like structure, but it is formed by cartilages and connective tissue ligaments. So, pharynx is a kind of tube muscular, right? Pharynx. But larynx is mainly cartilaginous and it has connective tissue ligaments. Then next to the larynx you have the trachea. Trachea is also known as air tube, air tube commonly general people they say they are tube or trachea. Trachea is formed by cartilages and smooth muscle. Cartilages and smooth muscle mainly. Those two structures form the trachea. Larynx is also known as sound box. Okay, some people um, know larynx as the sound box in your respiratory system. Why? Because inside the larynx you have the vocal cords and you know that the vocal cords produce sound. So we'll talk about those structures. Then we'll talk about a microscopic structure which is called the respiratory membrane. Respiratory membrane is the membrane that separates the blood and the air in the lung. So respiratory membrane is the partition between the blood and the air. So we'll see the structure 
of the respiratory membrane. Remember, through the respiratory membrane, gas exchange between the blood and the alveolar air take place. So, gas exchange takes place through the respiratory membrane. Between what? The capillary blood and alveolar air. Okay. Now you tell me, you know, la blood goes to the lung to get what? Oxygen, right? So, from the alveoli of the lung, you have, where you have the air, right? So, what will go to the blood from the lung? The oxygen, right? So, from the alveoli, through the respiratory membrane, oxygen will go to the blood, capillary blood. Make sense? And always remember that the carbon dioxide moves in opposite direction. Just keep that in mind. So, now you know that oxygen goes from the alveoli of the lung to the blood. So, which way the carbon dioxide will go? From the blood to the alveoli of the lung. Make sense? Always in opposite direction. So, if you know one, you know the other one. Okay. So, we will see the structure of the respiratory membrane. Then we will talk about the coverings of the lung. The connective tissue coverings of the lung are called pleura. So, we will talk about the pleura and then we will talk about the mechanisms of respiration. How the breathing or respiration takes place. We will talk about that. Then we will talk about a very important fluid secreted by the respiratory membrane that is called the surfactant. So, the surfactant is a fluid that is very important. Why? Because it keeps the alveoli open. Without the surfactant, the alveoli will collapse, will not be able to stay open, will collapse. So, surfactant keeps the alveoli open very important. First, the organs of the respiratory system, if you start from the top, first organ is the nose. Inside the nose, you have nasal cavity and around the nose, you have paranasal sinuses. The next organ is the pharynx. Then below the pharynx, you have the larynx and below the larynx, next is the trachea and the lower end of trachea divides into two primary or principal bronchi, right and left, primary or principal or main, same thing, primary, principal or main bronchi, same thing. How many? Two, because you have two lungs, right? And they will enter into the lungs. So, right bronchus will enter into the right lung, left main or principal bronchus will enter into the left lung. Remember, the difference between bronchus and bronchi is bronchus is singular, bronchi is plural. Okay? Then, inside the lung, the bronchi will divide again and again. <coughs> First, the, see here, uh, first, the primary or main bronchus will divide into secondary or tertiary bronchi, okay? Uh, sorry, secondary or lower bronchi, same thing, secondary or lower. Then, secondary or lower will divide to form the tertiary or segmental bronchi. Okay? Then, the tertiary or segmental will divide further to form the terminal bronchi. And then, terminal bronchi 
divides and form the respiratory bronchi then the alveolar duct and alveoli we'll see those just know that inside the lung the bronchi divide again and again okay and the last organs of the respiratory system are the lungs you have two lungs those are the last organs and inside the lung gas exchange takes place between the blood and the alveoli now lungs are filled with hundreds of millions of hundreds of million of tiny air balls those are called the alveoli so alveoli are microscopic air balls and you have hundreds of million of alveoli inside the lungs <clears throat> so what happens inside the lung you know that there are two primary main or principal bronchi right and left and they enter into the lungs inside the lungs they divide to form the secondary bronchi which is also called the lobar bronchi okay secondary or lobar bronchi and then lobar bronchi divide to form the tertiary bronchi tertiary divide to form the bronchioles now bronchioles are very narrow the diameter of the bronchioles is less than 1 mm so narrow tubes and then bronchioles divide to form the terminal bronchioles even is smaller narrower and the diameter of the terminal bronchioles is less than half a millimeter 0.5 millimeter okay so very narrow and then what happens terminal bronchioles divide to form the respiratory bronchial you see the last line here to form the respiratory bronchial then the alveolar duct and alveoli so that's the entire you know pathway of air so finally the air enters into the alveoli of the lung but before air enters into the alveoli it has to pass through all those tube like structures now the enter respiratory tract from the nose to the alveoli is divided into two zones the conducting zone and the respiratory zone conducting zone is only responsible for the transport of gas passes of gas no exchange of gas occurs in the conducting zone and the last part is called the respiratory zone where gas exchange occurs so what are the parts of the respiratory zone three structures where gas exchange takes place respiratory bronchial alveolar duct and alveoli only in these three structures gas exchange occurs that's why these three are the parts of your respiratory zone all other structures only for the passes of gas gas transport so which structures are the parts of the conducting zone here nose definitely starting from the nose then 
pharynx, larynx, trachea, then starting a primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. All those are only to take the gas inside from outside. And then a change occurs only in these three structures respiratory bronchioles, alveolar duct, and alveolar. Now, most of the gas exchange <coughs> occurs in the alveoli. Small amount of gas exchange occurs in the alveolar duct and respiratory bronchial, but most of the gas exchange occurs in the alveoli. <coughs> Nose, the first organ of the respiratory system. Nose has two parts, external nose and the nasal cavity. Only we can see the external nose from outside. The part you see from outside that is called the external nose. Inside the nose you have a big cavity, nasal cavity, it's pretty, pretty big, nasal cavity. Functions of your nose. <clears throat> Number one, moistening the air and also making the air warm. So warming and moistening the air, inspired air. Uh, it is important why you know the air you take inside from outside if the air is dry and cold and that enters directly into the lung that can cause the uh, infection problem okay uh, so uh, before the air enters into the lungs inside the nose what happens the air gets warmer and Moisture, okay, moist. Uh, how that happens? In the wall of the nasal cavity, a secretion occurs. That secretion is the mucus. Mucus secretion occurs. You know that, right? And that mucus, when the air comes contact to that mucus, it gets moist. Now, why the air gets warmer? Because in the wall of the nasal cavity, a lot of blood flow occurs. The blood flow is high. And you know that blood is slightly what? Warmer than the body, right? Body temperature. Blood is slightly warmer. So, a lot of blood flows in the wall of the nasal cavity. So, wall of the nasal cavity is slightly warmer. So, when the air comes contact to that, it gets warmer before it enters into the lung. Make sense? Number one. Number two, filtering and cleaning the inspired air. Two ways your nose filters and cleans the air. Inside the nose, you have hair that blocks some dirt or dust. And another way, as I have already mentioned, the surface of the nasal cavity is moist and sticky because of mucus secretion. So, that moist and sticky surface will trap some dust. So, those are the two ways the inspired air will be filtered or cleaned before it enters into the lung. Serves as a resonating chamber for speech. Your nose plays a role to make the sound better, to improve the quality of sound that you produce. You can easily test it, right? If you just close your nose and talk, you know the sound will be different. And you also know when you get cold, right? the sound changes. So, nose plays important role to improve the quality of sound. Smell 
and test. Uh, you know that inside the nose you have the olfactory receptors. Those receptors, olfactory receptors are for smell. smell are present inside the nose so the <coughs> nose helps to smell but also nose helps to taste the food you all, all also know when you get cold right you eat something you don't taste perfect right so you feel kind of tasteless so uh, nose also helps to taste the food why because to taste the food you must smell Perfectly. To taste the food perfectly, you must smell it. So that's why we say that actual flavor of the food you get when you eat and smell together. Okay. So smelling and tasting together gives the flavor of the food. That is important. Okay. Now we'll see inside the nose inside the nose there is a partition that is called the nasal septum that divides the nasal cavity into two halves right and left and from the lateral walls of the nasal cavity you know you have two lateral walls of the nasal cavity and from the lateral walls from each side, three shelf-like projections arise. Those are called shelf-like shelf-like projections arise. Those are called concha, nasal concha. Some people say concha, that's okay. So three nasal concha from each side, superior, middle, inferior. Then the roof of the nasal cavity is formed by two bones. Anterior bone is the ethmoid and posterior bone is the sphenoid. So ethmoid and sphenoid together form the roof of the nasal cavity. Now the floor. You see the floor of the nasal cavity is actually the roof of the oral cavity. So here this is the floor of the nasal cavity, okay? And this is the nasal cavity here, right? Because this is the floor. So this is the nasal cavity here and this is the oral cavity. So basically, the roof of oral cavity is the floor of nasal cavity. Makes sense? And the floor is called the palate that you can actually touch. Putting the finger inside the mouth or you can touch with your tongue uh, moving up. So that is the palate and palate has two parts. The front part is bony part which is the hard palate and the back part is the muscular part that is the soft palate. So palate has how many parts? Two. Anterior part is what? The hard palate. Posterior part is the soft. Okay. Now the hard part is the bony part and it is formed by two bones. Which bone is this? Here. Maxilla. This is maxilla. Maxilla, right? So front part of the palate is formed by the maxilla and back part is formed by the palatine bone. This is easy because it is palate, so palatine bone. So actually, uh, if you see the palate, this is the hard palate and this is the soft palate, okay? So, hard palate has anterior two-third part, which is formed by the maxilla, okay? And posterior one-third is formed by the palatine bone, okay? Palatine bone. And soft palate, now this is the soft palate. Inside the soft palate, you have the skeletal muscle. Remember, this is not a smooth skeletal muscle covered by thick mucosa, thick layer of mucosa. Okay. 
So inside is the skeletal muscle and outside is the mucosal lining, thick mucosal lining. So that's the soft palate and hard palate. Okay. So here you see the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. You are seeing one side. So you see three concave, superior, middle, inferior. Now concave are separated by folds. Those are called meatus. So there are three concave and in between the concave those foldings are called meatus. So you have three concave, three meatus. You can also see the roof of the nasal cavity, those two bones, ethmoid and spinoid, and the floor, hard palate and soft palate. Okay, those structures you can see here. Respiratory mucosa is the innermost lining of the nasal cavity. So, innermost layer or lining of the nasal cavity is called the respiratory mucosa and the epithelial lining of the respiratory mucosa is pseudo-stratified columnar. Why? Because all of you know that pseudo-stratified columnar cells have what? Cilia. Do you remember that? Cilia, soft hair like structures. So, what happens? Why in the respiratory, upper respiratory tract you have the pseudo-stratified columnar, ciliated columnar? Because you know that the dark particles, right, are trapped in the mucus. There, I have mentioned that. So, the mucus must be pushed away regularly, right, because the mucus gets dirty. So, the cilia, just now think that million of cilia move at the same time. That creates a lot of power to push the mucus down. Okay? Push the mucus down. And that is happening regularly. And new mucus secretion is also occurring. <coughs> Inside the nasal cavity, you have plenty of blood flow. A lot of blood flow that I have already mentioned and keeps the surface warm. Number two, also you have plenty of free nerve endings, sensory nerve endings and that's why inside the nose uh, the respiratory membrane is highly sensitive. You know that. If you put something inside the nose, you feel that, right? Extremely sensitive and that is very good because if something harmful tries to enter, you will sneeze. It will create sneeze. Make sense? And it will get out. So, making the surface highly sensitive by the sensory nerve endings is good for us. Because that triggers the sneezing. <coughs> okay. Now, we will see the processes of respiration. You remember I already mentioned that there are four processes of respiration. Only the first one we can see from outside. A person is taking the air in and out, right? We can, we can tell by looking that from outside. Other three processes take place inside. So, oh, <laughs> here, okay, so I'm surprised. So, what are those four processes? Pulmonary ventilation, which is breathing that we can see, external respiration, transport of gases and internal respiration. Okay. Pulmonary ventilation is very simple. It is the breathing, inspiration and expiration of air, also called inhalation and exhalation of the air. Okay. Then, um, external respiration. Just write it down that external respiration occurs in the lungs, inside the lungs. And if you know that, you already know what happens inside the lungs. 
oxygen goes from where to where? Oxygen inside the lungs, oxygen goes from the alveoli to the blood because blood goes there to get the oxygen, right? And now you tell me carbon dioxide should go from where to where? Blood to the alveoli, opposite, right? So that is the external respiration. Inside the lung, oxygen moves from the alveoli to the blood and carbon dioxide moves from the blood to the alveoli of the lung. Is it clear? Okay. Now, transport. We know that gases are transported by the blood, right? And blood is a part of cardiovascular system. You all know that, right? So, blood transports the oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, you tell me. Which way blood transports the oxygen? Towards the tissue or takes the oxygen away from the tissue? Towards, because blood gives the oxygen to the tissue, right? So, blood takes the oxygen to the tissue and brings the carbon dioxide back to the lung. From lung to the tissue, oxygen, and from tissue to the lung, carbon dioxide. Make sense? So, that is the transportation of gases. And then the last process is called the internal respiration. Just write it down. It happens in the tissue. And you already know what happens in the tissue. Blood gives what to the tissue? Oxygen to the tissue and gets carbon dioxide because opposite direction. So, oxygen from the blood to the tissue, carbon dioxide from the tissue to the blood. That is the internal respiration is it clear? Okay. So now you know that first two processes take place inside the respiratory system and last two processes take place inside the cardi circulatory system, cardiovascular system. You know that it change occurs through the capillary wall, right? Uh, in the tissue. Okay. So after the nose, Next organ is the pharynx, which is a muscular tube and it has three parts, nasopharynx, behind the nasal cavity, oropharynx, behind the oral cavity and laryngopharynx is the last part and where the laryngopharynx ends, the larynx starts. So at the end of this part, laryngopharynx, you have the larynx, right? So that's why it is laryngopharynx. Now, uh, you see that uh, by three different colors, uh, you can see those three parts here. Nasopharynx, mostly behind the nasal cavity, oropharynx, behind the oral cavity, and laryngopharynx is the last part. Now, You see the soft pellet attached to the back of the heart pellet and that is the structure roughly separates the nasopharynx and oropharynx. Above the soft pellet is the nasopharynx, below the soft pellet is the oropharynx. So we say roughly the soft pellet uh, is the boundary between naso and Oral. And the last part, you see the laryngopharynx and from the lower end of laryngopharynx, two tubes start anteriorly the larynx and posteriorly the esophagus. So those two tubes start from the lower end of the laryngopharynx. Why? <laughs> because you see, uh, the pharynx, when you inhale the air and also swallow the food, first both the food and air will pass through the pharynx, okay? Common tube, food and air. Then at some point they must be separated, right? Air should enter into the lung and food should enter into the stomach, right? So that's why two tubes start from the bottom of the laryngopharynx. Anteriorly the larynx, posteriorly 
the esophagus and food will enter into what the esophagus and the air will enter into the larynx right now how they are separated when you swallow the food what happens if this is the larynx this is the inlet of the larynx right inlet of the larynx and there is a cap that is called the epiglottis that moves up and down like this the epiglottis moves like this so when you swallow the food the epiglottis epiglottis will move down to close the laryngeal inlet make sense so laryngeal opening is closed so food will only be able to enter into the esophagus make sense it will not enter into the larynx another structure the soft palate you see the soft palate there when you swallow the food soft palate moves up so the food will not be able to enter into the nasopharynx or nasal cavity because that could be dangerous so food only go downwards so the soft palate will move up like this up like this and this opening will be closed so food will not be able to move up okay will not be able to enter into the nasopharynx or nasal cavity you know that if a small piece of food enters into the nasal cavity it is painful right it's not comfortable <laughs> so uh, you must stop that <clears throat> so just know a couple of things about the nasopharynx number 1 pharyngeal tonsil is attached to the posterior wall of the nasopharynx and another thing is the opening of the auditory tube opening of the auditory tube is present in the nasopharynx uh, so if this is your pharynx naso oro laryngeal this is the nasopharynx uh, you have the opening of the auditory tube here this is the auditory tube okay auditory tube another end is in your ear in the ear. okay so the auditory tube connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx so this is the middle ear and this is the nasopharynx okay and this is the auditory tube auditory tube is also called the pharyngo tympanic tube pharyngo you see there last line pharyngo tympanic tube or eustachian tube so it has three names auditory tube or pharyngo tympanic tube or eustachian tube okay eustachian tube <coughs> those two things just remember pharyngeal tonsil is attached to the wall of the nasopharynx and auditory or pharyngo tympanic tube one end ends there oropharynx oropharynx uh, is the middle part of the pharynx and it is a common passage for both the food and air now remember nasopharynx is behind the nasal cavity so it is only for the air but oropharynx and laryngopharynx both are for the air and food common and another thing you need to know here about nasopharynx the epithelial lining is pseudo stratified ciliated columnar same as your nasal cavity pseudo stratified ciliated columnar but in case of oropharynx and laryngopharynx the epithelial lining is 
stratified squamous. Now you tell me why is stratified squamous here? In which area you will get stratified squamous lining? Where the chance of what? I mentioned many times. Friction. Chance of friction is high, right? Since these two are both for air and food, right? Food will cause the friction. Only air will not cause the friction, right? Food will cause the friction. So that's why these two parts are lined with or by the stratified squamous. Okay. Now, uh, you see here the opening of pharyngeal tympanic tube and the pharyngeal tonsil. Those two things you see in the nasopharynx. Larynx. Larynx is the sound box, also called the sound box, and it is a structure mainly formed by hyaline cartilages. Also, it has ligaments or membranes, connective tissue ligaments or membranes. First, we will see the cartilages. The larynx has unpaired and paired cartilages. Unpaired cartilages are the thyroid and cricoid. Those are largest two. The largest cartilage is the thyroid cartilage and then second larger one is the cricoid cartilage those are single thyroid cartilage is also called the adam's apple that forms the laryngeal prominence here right it is prominent in male or female male why? Because this is interestingly the thyroid cartilage is sensitive to testosterone. This cartilage, this only this piece of cartilage is highly sensitive to testosterone. So when the testosterone secretion starts in uh, at puberty in boys, you will see suddenly the thyroid cartilage gets bigger. Okay. So that's the thyroid cartilage or laryngeal prominence or Adam's apple. Now paired cartilages are tiny. Those are two in number each type. Peritinoid, cuneiform and corniculate. And there is another cartilage which is the cap of the laryngeal inlet. I have already mentioned the epiglottis. So that covers the larynx inlet of larynx okay now remember that all these cartilages are hyaline except the epiglottis epiglottis is formed by elastic cartilage formed by what epiglottis elastic e e epiglottis elastic and that's why it can move up and down because it has a lot of elasticity. Here, this is the front view of the larynx. Here, larynx is from here to here. This is part of trachea. Okay. So, you see, this is the thyroid cartilage, the big one, and then below the thyroid cartilage, you have the cricoid, and in between, you have Cricothyroid ligament. Cricothyroid ligament. Very easy, right? Because that ligament is connecting those two structures, cricoid and thyroid. That's why crico, starting from the lower one, remember. And in between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage, you have a membrane that is called thyrohyoid membrane. Very easy starting from the lower one, right? Thyrohyoid membrane. So now that's why I said that uh, yeah. larynx is a cartilaginous structure and it has ligaments and membranes. 
if you see inside the larynx, you will be able to see those tiny paired cartilages, arytenoid, corniculate, cuneiform. Just know the names. Inside the larynx, you have the vocal folds to produce the sound. Now, you have two pairs of vocal folds. The upper pair are called the false vocal fold and the lower ones are called the true vocal folds. Okay, so false and true. False vocal folds are also called vestibular folds. So vestibular folds are also called false vocal folds. True vocal folds are responsible for the production of sound. Now, you see the vocal folds come from both sides like this. Okay. So, these are two true vocal folds and in between the two vocal folds, you have a space, the opening that is called the glottis. So, this is the glottis and when you talk, the glottis changes like this okay so opening between the true vocal folds is called the glottis so here you see true vocal folds the white structures and in between the opening is the glottis in first picture the glottis is closed in second one it is open so it opens and closes very fast during your when you put it south. Trachea. In the wall of the trachea, you have three layers. If you see from inside to outside, innermost layer is called the mucosa. Middle one is submucosa because it is under the mucosa. And then outermost one is the adventitia. Those are the three layers in the wall of the trachea. Again, tracheal mucosa has the epithelial lining that is pseudo-stratified columnar, ciliated column. Same reason because mucus secretion occurs right? inside the trachea should be pushed away. So, pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar. So, only you see in the upper respiratory tract where the food also passes that part is stratified is commerce. Make sense? Because food causes friction. Other parts are pseudo-stratified columnar have, has cilia. In submuco uh, also in the mucosa, you have goblet cells. Goblet cells, you know goblet? Goblet is what? Yeah. That cup to drink wine, right? So, uh, the cells look like that and the goblet cells secrete mucus. Mucus secreting cells or goblet cells. Okay. Then in the submucosa, which is a connective tissue layer, you have sero mucus gland. So serous and mucus secretion occur from the seromucus gland. Serous, just know that serous secretion is watery secretion and mucus is thick, sticky secretion. Okay. So, seromucus, serous and mucus secretion occurs. Adventitia, the outermost layer and in this layer, you have the tracheal cartilages. So, tracheal cartilages are located inside the outermost layer, which is the adventitia. So, inside the adventitia, you have the tracheal cartilages. Tracheal cartilages are incomplete rings of hyaline cartilage. So, basically, hyaline cartilage forms incomplete rings like this. Okay. 
So these are tracheal cartilages. Now, uh, since it is C-shaped, C-shaped hyaline cartilages, and these three ends get connected by the smooth muscle fibers. So this is smooth muscle. Okay. So that's why we say cartilage is formed by cartilage and smooth muscle. What kind of cartilage? Hyaline cartilage. And hyaline cartilage forms what kind of a structure? C-shaped. Okay. In complete rings. And in the back, the ends are connected by the smooth muscle. And that's why uh, the contraction and dilatation of the trachea gets easy because the cartilages are like this, right? So if the muscle is see, if the smooth muscle contracts, then it will get like this. Yes, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, if it was complete ring of cartilage, it was it would have been difficult to cause constriction. Okay. The you see here those three layers. <coughs> And in the back of the trachea, you have the esophagus. So they have also shown the esophagus, which is a part of the digestive system, GI tract. This is the actual histology of the tracheal wall. So you can see those three layers again. Uh, here. In the submucosa, you can see the ceromucus gland, that white colored gland. Also, in the in the mucosa, the goblet cells. Are, this is the goblet cell here. Okay, you can see some goblet cells. Okay, so we know that three last three structures of the respiratory tract belong to the respiratory zone, right? The respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar alveoli. Now, if you see those three parts, you see after the terminal bronchial, next is the respiratory bronchial. So, respiratory bronchial is the first part of the respiratory zone. And terminal bronchial is the last part of conducting zone. And then the alveolar duct and alveoli. Uh, when you go for shopping, you buy the grapes, right? Grapes. And you'll see uh, many grapes are attached to the steam. So, uh, your alveoli are like that. Let's see, uh, these are the stems. And alveoli get attached to it like this, like grapes. Okay? And this is the alveolar sac. Here is another sac. Okay? Alveolar sac. This is another alveolar sac. Cluster of alveoli. Okay? And this is the alveolar duct. The stems. <coughs> if you see the wall of the alveoli, you will see many pores or holes are present in the wall. Those are called the alveolar pores. Now, the interesting thing is that each and every alveolus gets the capillary bed on it. So, every or each alveolus has a capillary bed attached to the outer surface, which is amazing because you just think that inside your lung you have 
about 300 million alveoli. Now you can you can just think how small the alveoli are, right? Now every alveolus is getting capillary bed on the surface. So how beautifully and microscopically everything is designed, right? Why is that? To ensure that all alveoli can participate in gas exchange. If any alveolus, just think that this is an uh, alveolus and there is no blood capillary on it, then this alveolus is useless. Make sense? Because exchange of gas will not occur between the blood and the alveolus. So that's why every alveolus gets the capillary bed on the surface. Now, this is an alveolus and this is the capillary bed on it. So, this is the capillary. Capillary. This is the alveolus. So, you have what here? What do you have here? Inside the capillary. Not a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> so inside the capillary, you have the blood, right? Capillary blood. And what do you have here inside the alveolus? Inside the alveolus. And carbon dioxide gas, right? Here. So oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. Because we inhale the air, right? It has both oxygen. Okay. Now, uh, I can write here. Okay, blood and air, right? And now, uh, if you see, this is the wall of the capillary here. And let me use a different color. This is the wall of the alveolus. So this is the green one is the alveolus. So this is the alveolar wall. And this is the capillary wall. Make sense? And these two walls together form the respiratory membrane. The alveolar wall and the capillary wall. They are attached to each other and together form the respiratory membrane. So this is the respiratory membrane. Now you know that what happens to the respiratory membrane. Blood goes to the lung to get what? Oxygen, right? So from here, the oxygen will enter into the blood and carbon dioxide will always move in opposite direction. That means from here to blood to the alveolus. Make sense? And that's the external respiration. We know that. So oxygen moves in this direction. Carbon dioxide moves in that direction. Opposite. <coughs> Always. Everywhere. Okay. Now, if you see the wall of the alveolus and the wall of the capillary under microscope, the alveolar wall has two layers. It's the basement membrane and the epithelial line, simply squamous, okay. So this is the alveolar epithelium or epithelial lining and this is the basement membrane. Membrane. All epithelial cells are attached, supported by the basement membrane. So this is the wall of the alveolus. Now if you see the red one, that means the wall of the capillary, capillary wall also has two layers, a basement membrane and then the endothelial layer, that is the endothelium. So endothelium, it is also simply squamous okay? and this is the basement membrane. So you see the basement membrane of the capillary wall and the basement membrane of 
the alveolar wall they get attached to each other and form a fused together you can say because both are basement membranes same structure so fused basement membrane we can say that right together you can say fused basement membrane that's the middle layer and then in the capillary side endothelium in the alveolar side epithelium so those are the three layers of the respiratory membrane in the middle you have the fused basement membrane and then you have the alveolar epithelium capillary endothelium you see there those three are the layers now if you see the alveolar wall there are three types of cells present in the alveolar wall how many <coughs> three the most common is this one the simple squamous so alveolar wall is mainly formed by simple squamous and that is called the type one simple squamous is called the type one alveolar cells the most common type type 1 alveolar cells also you will see the surfactant secreting cells how many of you remember surfactant the very beginning i mentioned surfactant what is that surfactant is a fluid that keeps the alveoli open right that i said okay so the surfactant secreting cells are also present in the alveolar wall and those are called type 2 alveolar cells okay so you got type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells another type of cells are also present those are macrophages phagocytic cells macrophages now why you have three types of cells macrophages do what engulf phagocytosis right you know that macrophages do phagocytosis why you need the macrophages there because you know that when we inhale the air right air directly enters into the alveoli make sense and a lot of microorganisms can get in with the air right so the macrophages are there in the alveolar wall they will destroy the antigens make sense that's why you need many why you need surfactant secreting cells because surfactant keeps the alveoli open okay that fluid that fluid is very important to keep the alveoli open and why you need the simple squamous epithelial cells because gas exchange can easily occurs through simple squamous epithelial lining because squamous is flat or tall squamous flat, flat right mm -hmm. so it makes very thin membrane right mm -hmm. so the gas can easily get in and out pass through it so that's why you have three types of cells they are performing three different types of functions gas exchange is done by <coughs> simple squamous right layer so the simple surfactant secreting is done by type 2 surfactant secreting cells and phagocytosis is done by macrophages make sense now anatomy of a lung if you see a lung the upper pointed end is called the apex lower surface is flat and broad this broad white flat lower end is called the base makes sense right apex and base and the base rests on the diaphragm okay rests on the diaphragm and in the medial surface of the lung you have an area 
you know that primary trachea is here, right? Trachea divides into what? Primary bronchi, right? So primary or main or principal bronchus enters pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, lymphatics, nerves, all those structures pass through this area that is called the hilum of the lung. So this is the hilum of the lung through which the primary or main bronchus, pulmonary blood vessels that means pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, the lymphatic vessels, the nerves, they pass. Now if you see the right and left lungs, right and left lungs are slightly different from each other. I will just mention those differences between right and left lung. You need to remember the right lung is short and broad, shorter and broader. Left lung is long and narrow, longer and narrower. Right lung has two fissures. Now fissures are like cut. So if this is the lung, uh, in the right lung, you have two cuts or fissures like this. So if there are two fissures or cuts, then how many lobes it has? Three. Make sense? It will divide the lung into three lobes. The upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. Also called superior lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. Three lobes. So right lung has two fissures and three what? Lobes. In the left lung, you have only one fissure. So how many lobes you should have? Two. Only upper and lower superior and inferior. Left lung has a notch. Notch is U-shaped area. That is called the cardiac notch. Why? Because you have the heart mostly in the left side. You see here? This is the cardiac notch. The area like this. And your heart is here. So that's why this is attached to the it. That's why it is called the cardiac notch. Okay. Right lung does not have the cardiac notch. So those are the main differences between the right and left lungs. Okay. Blood supply to the lung. This is interesting. The blood supply between the heart and lung that is called what? Systemic or pulmonary? Mm -hmm. Between the heart and the lungs? Pulmonary. pulmonary, right? So, in pulmonary circulation, blood goes to the lung to get what? Oxygen, Oxygen right? Mm -hmm. So, arteries take the deoxygenated blood to the lung and veins bring the oxygenated to the heart. Make sense? So, that's the pulmonary circulation only to get the oxygen from the lung. Is it clear? Now, that is pulmonary circulation. Lung also has systemic circulation because lung needs the oxygen from the systemic circulation. Lung tissue needs the oxygen, right? Because like other tissues of your body, lung tissue also needs systemic circulation to survive, to get the oxygen. So your lung gets both the pulmonary and systemic circulation. Systemic circulation goes to the tissue, lung tissue, to give what? Oxygen. And in pulmonary circulation, blood goes to the lung to get the oxygen, not to give the oxygen, okay? To get the oxygen. Make sense? Okay, so let's stop here. Uh,